Hi everybody, welcome to the channel. I just came across an interview with Don Sherman on Autoline TV yesterday, and I wanted to make sure that you guys all got a chance to see it. It's talking about the 2020 mid-engine C8 Corvette and what his thoughts are and what it's going to be like. So I found it very interesting, and I thought I would share it with you guys. Hopefully you enjoy it. Thanks. We got to let everybody know the auto extremist is in the house. Peter Dolorenzo. I'm back. Yes. He's back again. Yeah. Good having you, man. Good to be here. And we should let everyone know our special guest today is Don Sherman. I guess we call you a freelancer. Or... I'm a contributor, but I'm not that special. <laughs> but thank you anyway. <laughs> For this show, you are. And we're going to be talking all about the new C8 Corvette, the mid-engine one. If you'd like to join in on the conversation, Shoot us an email, send it to viewer mail at autoline.tv, or we'll even take one of the phone calls. 620-288-6546 is that number. Remember, keep your questions short and to the point. We're far more likely to be able to ask them on the show if you do that. But anyway, Don, C8 Corvette. GM doesn't even admit that this car, at least officially, does not even admit that the car exists and yet you got some pretty good intel on the thing how do you dig this all up well a thousand one um, camo prototypes have been spotted uh, mark royce has pretty much acknowledged that there is a next generation corvette coming and uh, there's been a dozen concept cars built over the years so there, there's no doubt that it's coming there's some confusion as to exactly when. I stuck my neck out saying it would be at the Detroit Auto Show, and I think it was planned for that, but obviously it didn't appear. Uh, but I still believe it will be a 2020 model. It will be in production before year's end. It will be shown later this summer, and deliveries will begin in roughly 11 months from now. They're going to have a fly-in press intro for it, aren't they? My Latest guess is it will be in conjunction with the 25th anniversary of the National Corvette Museum in Bowling Green. That happens at the end of August. And they have that track there now. There's a track there. It's got heavy GM involvement, investment. It's a good place. Um, the weather can be trusted then. There's no competition from other things at an auto show. So that, that may be. Yeah. But again, it's speculation. So, so what do you what do you think you know about what this car will be? I think it will be those things I said. Plus, um, begin with a pushrod uh, engine, a starting price not too much beyond today's between sixty and seventy thousand dollars. Overlap with C7 for a period because not everybody understands or wants a mid-engine car. Uh, it will be the first of a series with d different powertrains coming over the years, just like C7, uh, up to and including uh, topping the 1,000 horsepower mark with, with hybrid, maybe eventually a, a pure electric. I, I, I don't know much about that, but, but certainly hybrids have been acknowledged, sort of a uh, NSX in, in American trim. You've mentioned GM has built several prototypes, concept cars, mid-engine Corvettes over the years. One dozen. A dozen, really? I had no idea it, that many. Th this is 60 years in the making. So why now? Um, I think the driver is because um, the owner body is aging. The last three generations have pretty much looked like each other. And performance is at a bit of a stalemate. The more power you put up the front, the faster you burn down the back tires. So how do you rectify that? It's not with traction control. It's with changing the physics. And the physics are strongly in favor of putting the engine back there. You, you improve launch traction. You improve braking into turns. You reduce the polar moment. You let it be more, make it more responsive turning in, and when you're done turning, more responsive going straight again. So, you know, race cars have known this for 90 years. 
and uh, other mid-engine sports car makers have known this forever, and Zora discovered it about 60 years ago. Not from the physics. I, I went to his home, Zora Kostuntov. The Father of the Corvette. Sort of. <laughs> okay. He was the first chief engineer, and you could say he's the godfather, or, okay, let's call him the father. Okay. I said, Zora, I went there with one question. Why, why are you so fascinated with mid-engine? And he reflected on a failure at Sebring in 1957. With the SS. Corvette SS. They literally cooked John Fitch. His conclusion from that was uh, heat should be behind the driver, heat source. Get the engine, instead of heating up the cockpit and the floor and the body with exhaust pipes, get it out of the way, put it in the back. I think he, once he made that leap, he discovered all the physics. He would have known them anyway, because he grew up in Germany. He watched uh, Auto Union and, and Benz race mid-engine cars. So he probably knew the physics in the back of his mind. But once you start down mid-engine path, where else are you going to go? So why did it take 60 years, though? I mean, if, if he knew this back then, and, and we've had seven generations of Corvette, I mean, okay, we'll, get, we'll, we'll say we had six because the first one was what it was, which started didn't it all. You didn't count it. But, he, but I'm just saying that, I mean, so... He tried hard. He tried hard with serves. Serve he, one and serve two. There's 12. Chevrolet... Uh, Engineering research vehicle. Yeah. And those were quasi-race cars. Those were his race experiments. It was going to be... Um, Formula One type race car than a Can-Am type race car, but they were experiments, but he couldn't sell it through marketing and uh, the GM hierarchy. And when There's he, the serve too. When he yeah. left, he passed it on to, to Dave McClellan with the words, Dave, you must build mid-engine. McClellan failed too. He didn't try as hard, but he, he sort of bucked the politics in the company best he could. Same with Dave Hill. Um, finally, though, about 10 or 12 years ago, a, a believer in the form of Tad Juchter came along, not as chief engineer, but he, he made a case for it. And he sold it to Lutz. He sold it to um, the chairman at the time. It was slated for production. Then the bankruptcy hit, and it went away. Corvette, everything went away. GM went away. And when it came back, it would be risky to, to start, start up Corvette again with mid-engine, so they did C7 instead. So, Peter, why, why, from, from your experience, I mean, with the Serve 1 and the Serve 2, and presumably these things worked out all right, um, there, there obviously was no impetus behind going forward with that stuff. Well, you have to remember Zora was an, an outsider, inside outsider. I mean, he was a maverick. I mean, the famous clash with Bill Mitchell over the split window stingray. Zora did not want that split in the back in 63. Mitchell won the battle, but Zora won the war because the next year it was gone. And um, there was always a clash between the state upper management of General Motors and the true believers of Chevrolet engineering. And they were always way out front. Yeah. And when they couldn't have an outlet, they teamed up with Jim Hall. And basically the Chaparrales was a factory GM racing effort. Uh, and that's, that was their outlet. But as far as transferring, and they did some beautiful mid-engine cars. The Aerovet was my favorite, which still looks stunning today. Um, they did Wankel-powered cars. They did aluminum body cars. Yeah. There were 12 in all. There was a Cadillac CN. There was one in Australia. And uh, there just wasn't a groundswell that they could detect from customers saying, we got to have a mid-engine Corvette. Uh, and customers are, are more mature, they play golf, they appreciate the value. They're, a lot of them are interested in performance, but a lot of them are not. My neighborhood's full of these guys, and they're typically uh, 60 years old. You say mid-engine to them, and they, a blank stare comes across their face. But you can't cling to it forever. 
the, the old way, I believe. Well, the, the difference, they almost had one, as Don said, and then the bankruptcy hit. That was a green-lighted project, and then they shelved it. And I think the difference is they made a business case, and everyone said, oh, the mid-engine Corvette's going to be 170000 blah, blah. No, it isn't. It's going to be within very much reason of the current car and price. And as soon as GM figured out how to do that, that's when the program was green-lighted by Royce. So, Don, uh, the chatterers in the, the chat room are wondering if you work for GM or how do you come by all your information on the C8? I've got an um, advanced network of sources, including Peter DiLorenzo. <laughs> um, and I poll suppliers. It's ratted you out. Peter knows. When you ask a supplier, let's say Brembo, for example, are you working on mid-engine Corvette? They don't say yes but you watch their eyes, their eyes react. They don't deny it. They've been working on it forever. And uh, it's, it's reinforcements of that type. And there are, there are leakers from inside GM. There's, there's a mid-engine Corvette um, blog.com place that has 2,000 members. So there's regular news from them, including this very week, one of them captured a fleet of six mid-engine Corvettes in camo in Yuma, Arizona with Mark Royce in the passenger seat smiling back at the camera. So it's no secret. Not to mention the footage of the racing cars. Pratt and Miller built mid-engine Corvette racing cars that have been running for six months. Yeah, now. there's video on, on YouTube right now of those cars at uh, the Nordschleife at the Nürburgring, at Sebring as well, and I think maybe I'm thinking of the one that you talked about. That, no, it couldn't be. You They've run them at Road America too. Oh, okay. I, d I did get one tidbit this morning from an impeccable source. Oh, here, here's one of the heavily uh, camoed ones. It's not that heavy, it's just a paint job. <laughs> yeah, from an impeccable source that said it came in a question, how, how many parts are shared from the C7 to the C8? I said, you got me, and he said, one. Wouldn't tell me which Some one. Some switch, I've heard yeah. the same thing. It's just a switch. Okay, the parts aren't shared, but they're just shuffled. That doesn't mean they're more expensive. It's got a yeah. transaxle, no. it's got an engine, it's got suspension stuff. Of course, it's a leap forward in technology where possible, but uh, and there, there are investment costs for tooling, et cetera, but they know how to do it. They've got the engines more in-house now. They got a fresh paint shop that's probably uh, vastly more efficient. They've got the ability to build seven and eight together interspersed on the line. So, you know, they've had ample time to figure this out. Yeah. So do you guys think that Ford forced their hand going mid-engine with the new GT? which has been a real halo for the brand, won Le Mans its first year into it and all? You know, I don't think so. I mean, this battle's been going on internally at GM, as Don said, for 60 years. And I think, yeah, I mean, they looked at the 4GT and said that's cool and all that. But they had to come to terms with it, their own history, their own heritage. And, you know, even though it wasn't out front in the open, I mean, GM has a glorious history of factory-supported racing programs, and the Chaparral was example number one. And uh, I just think that the Ford, they look at that as that's Ford's deal, but, you know, they had to come to terms with their own. Yeah, well, look at the price and volume on the Ford GT, and I must offer a correction. They didn't win Le Mans. They won a class. A class, exactly. Hey, 50 start, years yes. ago, sure, they won Le Mans. Right. I give them full credit. Right. It's one of the many mid-engine cars I got to drive over the years to convince me this is it. I've known this for 50 years when I started this enthusiasm. So what do you think led them to pull the trigger this time? Is it having Royce in there who is a, a true car guy or, or what? It's having, uh, it's sort of getting out of bankruptcy. It's having Royce a believer. It's having a business case where it can be profitable. It's having Tad's Euchter. And like I say, the C7 customers are aging. They're not going to last forever. You've got to get the next generation. You've got to get the Countach photo 
on the wall in the bedroom of the 15-year-olds. So when they get to be 20 and start a dot-com, they buy a Corvette instead but, of a Ferrari. But, but wasn't, the, wasn't the C7 supposed to solve that problem? Why, how could it? Well, it looked radically different than the C6. It, look, it looked more like a, almost like a Japanese manja sort of car in terms of its, its sheer planes and design than any it dis- Corvette it's did. It's different from C6, correct. And former chief engineer Dave McClellan called it morphed from the C8 design. So it's a preview, potentially a preview of C8 surface execution and things. That, those were his words, the word morphed. Uh, I hope C8 has more beauty than C7. I, I see C7 as the beast. I want C8 to be um, the beauty, and I want it to be my car. I have a deposit on one. But if it's not beautiful, if I don't love it, I'm going to sh- cash out my deposit. So, Peter, why, why does Chevrolet have a Corvette? Well, that's a good question. I mean, way back when they did the original, which was a show car, the 53, Yes. Uh, it really didn't have a reason for being either, but it ended up at Chevrolet. Carly Earl wanted one for... Yeah. Um, I've been advocating to have Corvette be its own division for years now. I agree with you on that. And, you know, they, you know, they, they could take the V-Series Cadillacs, which kind of are orphaned within the Cadillac brand, and morph them into Corvettes like Porsche's done. Porsche's done a masterful job. I haven't exactly agreed with all it, but they're printing money, so. Um, I, you know, it's, it's stayed under the auspices of the Chevrolet brand, I think, just for sheer inertia all these years. And every time I talk to someone about a separate Chevrolet or Corvette division, they're just like, they go white and they, they <laughs> wander <laughs> off. And, <laughs> muttering. Yeah, muttering. And so. There's a halo effect, not only, of course, for Chevrolet, but for GM. And the halo works two ways, the prestige of a brand, and it's a destination for kids to stay working here, not go to Silicon Valley, to want to really work on something world-class, something Ferrari-like in America. So I think that's a a good reason for it to exist, uh, whether it's a Chevrolet or just a Corvette uh, by itself. Jarrett Allen wrote in to say the C8 seems really cool, or he thought it was really cool until he found out there would be no manual transmission. Why? Well, there's no manual transmission in a Ferrari. And the why is because it's, you can't, it's hard to make a business case with two, two transmissions. And dual clutch is kind of the future of everything, where you get the performance, you don't have to have the skill, you don't have to certify and build two. And I, I'm sorry to see the clutch pedal go away, but it's just a fact of life today. Don, are they going to build both C7 and C8s? Are they going to keep one as sort of like an entry Corvette and the C8 the step up Corvette classic? My speculation is yes, because there's demand for C7. It may taper off. It may be tapering off now as people are depositing on eight instead of buying sevens. So my theory is that they will wait and see. How 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 do customers like C8 when they see it in the flesh. Remember when C7 happened, a lot of people went out and they didn't like it. They, they're, they're conservative. They don't like a shift away from round taillights. They didn't like uh, not uh, covered headlights. So they bought the, the previous car for a while. Then they came around when they saw them on the street. I think uh, that's just the nature of Corvette buyers. Let's see, we've got a, a number of phone calls here. Carmen, let's bring in one of them. Uh, this is Clem Zorowski at Delmont, Pennsylvania. My question is, will the new C8 Corvette have coilover suspension or will it still have the cross buggy springs? Thank you. A CAD drawing leaped, uh, leaked from, presumably from GM, showed very clearly coilover in the front. And I studied the rear in detail, didn't see any spring shock absorbers. I don't think there's room for what you're calling buggy springs. Those were are very efficient. They're light. Made of plastic, 
Carbon fiberglass. Plus, fiberglass. It's transverse spring, right? Right. I, I own a 67 Corvette, and I traded out the multi-leaf rear spring for one of those and saved 70 pounds. Man. That one part. And it's adjustable. So it makes good sense. People think they're buggy springs. It doesn't have much prestige. So I, I don't think that that's made the leap to C8. Um, there's been a delay in the program. Like you said, you thought it was going to be introduced at the Detroit Auto Show this year. So did so many other people. It didn't happen. The word that came out is that it had heating problem, or, or excuse me, electrical problems. Somebody else told me, no, that's electrical. And they said uh, heating uh, is just a use, uh, or I should say electrical is just a euphemism for heating problems. And there can be heating problems with a mid-engine car. My sources say that all GM products are making the leap in global architecture, global electrical architecture from A to B, including Corvette, it's causing a lot of issues and problems. That's one reason for a potential delay, why it wasn't shown in Detroit. Another issue is, I've heard, is that the 1,000 horsepower powertrain or thereabouts uh, distorted the aluminum space frame. And that requires some oops. Hey, when that happens. Some help. And there's another third issue, which I can't put a finger on. There's some friction between, I'm guessing, between design and the user engineer enthusiast uh, side of the picture. It could be visibility. It could be the cockpit design. It could be the shape of the steering wheel. But Tadge is serious enough that he wants to resolve that. But I think uh, these things, that's the reason why it wasn't shown in Detroit. What's the hurry? They want to get it right and that, not have to recall, not have to fix things. So they're taking their time on it. An uh, interesting thing, uh, that this goes to the racing program. Uh, Corvette Racing is going to run the C7 at Daytona next year and Sebring and at Le Mans. Next year? I mean this year. This year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And... The reason for that is Ford pulled the wool over the French for the 24-hour Le Mans, the, the Ford GT. They wanted it to run in the 50th anniversary, and they made the French all these promises. Oh, we're going to have it in production in August, and it'll just be a few months. It wasn't in production for a year after that, so the French told, basically told Corvette Racing now, when we see the car, you can race it, but I mean, so Ford screwed it up for everybody. Well, I had also heard that with uh, uh, the WEC, you can you cannot change cars in the middle of a season. Whatever you start the season with is what you got to run the whole season with. Yeah, so Corvette Racing isn't going to show up with the C8 till Daytona in 2020, mm -hmm. which and it's, is to me too bad. All those performance adjustments. It's probably favorable to for a strong finish on C7 because they know the Bennett's of of eight. They know what Ford did. They're not going to give them any break out of the box. So might as well stay with yeah. the proven quantity. Well, well, let me ask a question that I'm going to have both of you jump up and pummel me for asking. So General Motors is spending a tremendous amount of money engineering this this vehicle, the likes of which they have never made in production before, correct? And we're talking about something that's going to cost roughly 70, 80 grand, right? Roughly, okay. maybe less. Or maybe more, we don't know, right? So no. here's, here's the question. When, when you have one of their competitors, Porsche, pouring lots of money and lots of effort into the Taycan, which is an electric vehicle, which will be performance vehicle, why isn't General Motors doing that, and why are they doing a Corvette? Why are they not doing a full-out electric Corvette right out, of the, right out of the box? Well, I think further out in the development of the C8, you're going to see hybrid, and then you're going to see an all-electric one eventually. Um, Defending GM's honor, they're the global leader in electrification. If you look at history, EV1, Volt, Bolt, did they make money? Did they recall them and crush them? Did they get blamed for killing the electric car? But what did Mary Barra say? We're going electric. Mark Royce has said it. So that's my question. Why aren't they going electric well, with today, this? With, yeah. 
They have Chevrolet Bolt. Buy one if you'd like. It's pure electric. I understand that. It's way ahead of the Taycan in the anything uh, Porsche or VW has done. It's a pretty good product. I think the leap to the mid-engine configuration is one thing. I think if they not only did that, but say, okay, here it is, it's all electric, that would have killed the car. I agree completely. Phase into it. Yeah. They're, they're the last adopters. And like we were talking about Formula E. I've tried, but they're, part of the thrill racing is the the feeling in your gut. Visceral sound, and the, the I, thunder. And you, you're watching and you're hearing slot car noises from your youth. And it does, it's just nothing for me. But Formula One doesn't have a good sound either to me. No, I, I, it's I can't. It's a bit of a buzz. I can't stand okay. Formula One. I mean, they need to go back. Like I've written this a bunch of times in my motorsports column, bring back the screen. Mm -hmm. That's what you go to a Formula One race. It's just, so you, you go there and you just go, oh my God, this is awesome. Now it's just like eh, UPS trucks, twin turbo <laughs> UPS trucks. The smart electric car producers will have artificial soundtracks. When you rev it up, it makes noise. Noises you like, noises you can adjust. You can have this one, this one, this one, but it won't be totally silent. It won't be a, a hum or a horror. That's where Formula E's missed the boat. Now in 2007, when I proposed the Hydrogen Electric Racing Federation, right in the rules was every manufacturer had to have their own sound signature, which can be a combination of amplified noise and wind going over the car, which creates a noise. And all the manufacturers were, yeah, that's cool. Formula E, they don't do that. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, if Porsche, Porsche and Mercedes are gonna go into Formula E, they should dial in some sound to their cars. So that they sound different. I mean, so they sound like race cars. Yeah, it's not just, slot cars. Yeah, it, yeah. So hey, uh, uh, another viewer uh, wrote in, Doc Wolf. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but he's saying he thinks that the reason they went to, uh, as he points out, a rear mid-engine Corvette is the Camaro's gotten to be so good. He said their performance pro profiles overlap a great deal and present the Camaro as a bargain alternative. He says this takes away from Corvette sales and status, so that's why they had to justify the C8 as being fundamentally different. You buy that, Don? No. Okay. Um, Camaros aren't selling great. Uh, I think that Camaro needs to be on a fresh track where you can actually see out of it and it doesn't look like a... I think the Camaro design was the first major miss by GM design yeah. in a well, while. I agree. I, I think that the look of the car is terrific. The drive of the car is terrific. But compared to the Mustang, you feel like you're sitting in a bathtub. There's no trunk space and absolutely no rear seat space. So even though it's a terrific looking, here we got a picture of it, and driving car, for people who want something as an everyday driver, they're going to go with the Mustang instead of the Camaro. You could uh, advance it if you have to keep that 69 look, advance it a model year to the 70 and drop the belt line, I think the problem would be solved. Well, they, they had two proposals. One was this one and one was a, more like the 70. I would have gone with the 70. Me too. Those are handsome cars. Yeah. And to be fair to the Camaro team, the sales loss of Camaro last year was 25%, which is the same as it was for Corvette, so. Okay, give us some Mustang figures. <laughs> Well, you know, these are U.S. figures, too. Remember, uh, Mustang now has a steering wheel available on the right-hand side for markets that need that. And Ford's done a decent job of exporting them. I, I don't think it would boost these numbers completely, but Gary, well, what Well, Mustang there? was only down 7.4% and considerably outsold Camaro. And Challengers sell remarkably well purely on horsepower and... Tradition, basically, and, you know, astute marketing. They, they look very traditional. Yeah. So we had 76,000 Mustangs, 51,000 Camaros. Yeah, and the, the 76,000 Mustangs, I'll bet it's probably more like 86 to 90,000 when you include exports. Mm. Somewhere I have. And you're right, Challenger's done pretty good. In fact, there's a new Challenger coming this year, or supposed uh, to be this year. Challenger 67,000, and it was actually up 3%. Yeah. Horsepower and right. marketing. Brilliant marketing.
with uh, the Hellcat and the Demon. They've really they've got a new the Dodge Brothers. They've got a new marketing <laughs> right. campaign now for those cars. For yeah, the performance go was it a muscle muscle city or muscle car city or something? I've I've only seen it a couple times. I like it. They they show them here plowing through snowbanks for Christ's sake. I could see having a Challenger, normally aspirated Challenger, with all the stuff on it. I don't need that normally aspirated motor would be fun to have. Hey, uh, we got to take a, a commercial break right now. Give a shout out to the sponsors that make the show possible. We've got more questions from the audience, more phone calls. We got Dr. Data coming up, uh, and we'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> 